I'm Doug Fern, and this is my take on music recording. Robin Eaton is a songwriter, musician, vocalist, and studio owner based in Nashville. I've known Robin for over 40 years, since he lived in nearby Wilmington, Delaware. He came into my studio around 1980 to record demos for several songs, and I was blown away by the quality of his compositions. In this informal and wide-ranging conversation, Robin talks about his early influences, such as writing poetry when he was five years old, his adventures in the music business in the U.S. and in Europe, and how he eventually settled in Nashville and now owns two very successful studios. We talk about some of Robin's songs. There are links to the songs on my podcast website, dougfern.com, under extras. As a songwriter, Robin has had a long-time collaboration with Jill Sobiel and many others. I think, you know, we were, we were lucky enough to have grown up and to have started music at a time when so much was going on. And I, I you know, I, I grew up not far from you in Wilmington, Delaware. And, you know, I was kind of a middle-class kid with my father was really into the big band scene and Frank Sinatra and, um, you know, also musicals. I can remember running around the dining room table, you know, singing songs from Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, and then, and then, and then getting into, you know, I'd, I'd ride in his little car to school, a Metropolitan, and he always had the radio on, and I remember... I always was drawn to kind of quirky songs like Purple People Eater and My Friend the Witch Doctor and there was there was the full spectrum of what was on the radio that I got to hear usually in a car. This was in the 1960s? This was actually in the late 50s. You know, I mean I I uh in the the 60s of course I listen to the Beatles and the British Invasion. But before that, I went to see Peter, Paul, and Mary in Philadelphia. I went, I never saw the Kingston Trio, but, you know, Charlie on the MTA, uh, you know, I found a ukulele in the closet, had been given to my my grandparents uh, from Lily, Queen Lily Ukiani. It was this beautiful little... Uh, ukulele and I once I discovered it I, I sort of started plunking on it at probably the age of 12 or so and then by the time I was in my teen years uh, I was uh, I had moved on to uh, getting a Stella and then from a Stella moved up to a uh, a Guild D44 which uh, I still have and which is sitting over in the corner there and you know it was you know, getting into bands in the Wilmington area, it was pretty, pretty cool. You know, there were, there were so many great people to uh, work with. I mean, I was in school, played dances, you know, that sort of thing. Well, that was a pretty amazing time. I mean, when you turned on the radio in, in the 60s, it was every day there was something you never heard before. I mean, not just you hadn't heard that song. It was a sound you had never heard before. And it was a really exciting time. And I think that inspired a lot of people to make music because, you know, there were no limits. It, it was Prior to that, I think to, for the most part, it, everybody was pretty much in the same genre. And, right. And... Uh, and now suddenly you had, didn't have those restraints anymore. I know. It was, it was amazing. And it was the excitement of being, in, of, of being a, a player and a, a musician in the 60s was that there were no limits. And someone had told me, you know, you're never off more than one fret, so just go for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And I, I always like that advice, you know, the kind of idiot <laughs> idiot advice They're like just just go ahead and play because your studio I mean this was jumping forward to the the 70s but 
I know a lot of the people that I played with ended up recording at Veritable. You know, some of them are, are, are gone, but some of them are still around. Um, it was so exciting to come into your studio and actually do real demos, you know? I mean, I think, uh, you know, it was really a formative thing for me to uh, look at that big uh, dial at the back, you know, that big meter behind you and you standing there and it just all sounded so good to me. We did three songs. I went to Paris shortly after that, following a girl over there. And, you know, I was playing in Paris at the American Center and uh, always looking in the paper. And I, I saw what's called a petite annonce, which is like a little announcement in the paper. Uh, producer seeks singer-songwriter. And I went over to this place and knocked on the door. And this guy came to the door <laughs> with a parrot on his shoulder. Uh, Jean-Pierre Jean Casacoli, his name was. And he said, oh, Robin, come on in, you know, and w went in, had a cup of tea, and I put on the songs from Veritable, and he went, oh, man, I, I think I can get you a record deal. And he went out and got me a record deal with Warner Brothers in Paris, which was hilarious and fun. So I got to, <laughs> I got to uh, hang out in Paris with my lovely girlfriend and make a record. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, you I never mean, know. You never know where things are going to lead. You never do, and I, that's that is a good point for people in who are starting out or are young and and thinking that it's impossible to do. If you just keep doing it, you know, somehow, you know, somebody's going to find you and love what you do. So that was that was a kind of my start in the actual music business. You know, doing. TV shows with Iggy Pop and in the south of France. And I remember another guy who had a parrot on his shoulder that I did uh, this thing down in Cannes, this TV show with this guy who, like, <laughs> you know, it was all singing to the track. So it was kind of funny, and the French TV was is pretty bad. But uh, it was kind of great with Iggy Pop. I remember he... He was singing along to his song. He wasn't singing along. He was just standing there. And the guy with the steady cam was holding the steady cam. And Iggy Pop, you know, he lit a cigarette while his song was going on and uh, took a deep drag, looked into this big lens, and put his cigarette out on the big lens. <laughs> and the guy was complete. And I thought to myself, man. You know, that's that's what it takes. <laughs> you know, I was there with my white suit and, you know, dutifully singing my little pop song. And Iggy Pop blew my mind. And he just, when he came off stage, he said, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's just showbiz. You know, he was very nice. Came back, I was in bands in New York, and uh, I was in a band called The Leisure Units, which I don't know, I'll be amazed if any of your listeners know, know who The Leisure Units were, but it was an amazing band. And we almost got signed. Uh, we had a final audition with Clive Davis, who passed. But um, it was great. We played CBGBs, and, you know, I, get, I was playing bass. Uh, got to borrow Tina Weymouth's uh, amp. Uh, from the Talking Heads, and um, kind of kind of a cool scene there, playing CBGBs, opening for John Cale, New Year's Eve, 1980, which was, uh, you know, we went to the sound check and no one, no one was in the club, uh, just Hilly Crystal, and uh, okay, set up, we got to get get going here, and and then we'd. Uh, we sound checked, and then when we came back around 11 o'clock, because it was a midnight start, we couldn't get in. I mean, it was just it was so packed. And that was a real thrill to play CBGBs <laughs> on New Year's Eve when you had, to, you had to fight your way through, you know, um, to get to the stage. It was so much fun. So at what point did you start writing your own songs? Uh, I started writing my songs... Uh, Probably when I was about five years old, I started writing little poems and, you know, like 
D is for dog. I think that is right. And I'm sure that some dogs are quite able to bite. And some are so big and some are so small. And some dogs are hardly a dog at all. A collie is a dog that has lots of hair, but I'm told that some dogs are partly just partly bare. I mean, you know, that was third grade, and from there on, you know, I kind of just kept writing little crazy verse, and once I picked up the guitar and the ukulele, it was just a segue into writing my own songs. Well, Com- hints of greatness at five years old. <laughs> Well, I'm amazed I know that still. You know, in some of the little bands that I've played in, I've I've used some of my older poetry and to write songs, which uh, has turned out okay. Well, I know uh, that from from the the demos that you did, you know, at my studio, that I was just blown away by the quality of your writing, and the, the songs were so clever. We actually, on a project I was working on, we actually used a couple of your songs. You remember that? Uh, I don't, but that's uh, that. That's not unusual that I don't. <laughs> what what project? Oh yes, I think I do remember that. We used Kong song. Right, you right. Still do that song, but that's a great song. Well, what and was the pro- what was the project? I, I was working with a couple of arrangers who wanted to do this album, and it was this kind of eclectic collection of songs. And the the project never went anywhere, even though we had great people playing on it. I mean, let's see, I don't think it was on any of yours, but we had Bernard Purdy playing drums on most of the tracks. It was really a, a really oh, wow. fun project. And the other song, and I can't remember the title of it, but it was about always getting a busy signal when you were calling your girlfriend. Huh. Remember that? What's the name of that song? Well, there is, uh, let's see, I did Murder in the Dark, Kong Song, and Bacon Burger. And then I did a song on Z Records later that had 246-8000 right about the time that that other telephone song came out, <laughs> which yeah, didn't bode. Yeah, that's the did, one. That was one, two, four, six, eight thousand. All, all those times, my fingers in the holes. Oh, cold shoulder. I think I do remember. I think I have a copy because I have a copy of that song sung by someone else. And I don't know who it is. Yeah, well, that, that was probably that project. Uh, and you the guy were sang there, much I'm better. pretty sure. Was I there? I yeah, that was, um, yeah, because you brought in... Her name was Susanna. I remember uh, that. Yes, Susanna and, Dent. Susanna yeah. Dent, who was my partner in uh, in Ricky Vaughn, which was a record I did on Z Records, Michael Zilka's label. Uh, it never came out, but we had a, a lot of fun. And she, recorded. Was, she, she was cute. <laughs> yeah, and she did a great job on that. I mean, it was just so so perfect for the song. I yeah. have copies of both of those, and you know I don't normally put any music in the podcast, just because the quality is not very good. But the only copies I have from that I think are off a cassette, and I'm not even sure they were the final version. But if you're okay with it, I'll I'll put links to those so people can listen to them. Yeah, and I could, I, you know, I could also, I could send you. Uh, you can put a link to that, or or I could send you my verse, my the record, and you could listen to it and and see. Ricky Vaughn was cool, and it was very eighties. And and uh, yeah, the guy that sang the versions we did, his name was Frank Mancano. Okay, he had a good voice. <laughs> yeah, he was a real good singer, and uh, I ran into him a few years ago in New York at the AES show, so we had a nice reminisce about that project. But the one thing about that song I remember, and I don't know if you remember this part or not, but there was a a keyboard part that you had done on the demo, which was some little tiny Casio yeah, or something. It was keyboard. on the original the original Casio. Right. Dee, 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 dee. Yeah, it was it was and I remember being an electric lady recording the thing and being in you know, the control room. I think we were using uh, the guy who was, oh man, I hope I can remember his name, who was engineering. 
anyway, he was, um, he made me, had to make a cord for the little mini plug in the back of the little cat, the tiny little Casio, you know, the little one that mm -hmm. looks like a calculator to plug into yeah. this, you know, millions of dollars worth of gear. <laughs> 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 I, and we still have that uh, next door at Alex the Great. And um, uh, that's great. That's and great. it's still the wiring is intact, which I really like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember we had in my studio, we had a whole ton of synthesizers. So we figured, you know, we'll pick out a nice synthesizer for that part. And we played <laughs> around with everything and nothing sounded right. And finally, I said, and, and I yeah. think you played it. I and I said, I yeah, I said, Robin, let's just put a mic on that little thing and record it. And that's what ended up on the record. You know, it sounded great. Yeah, it's this thing. I know you don't really put music on your podcast, but I think I can. It, I think it was this. I think it was. That was it. <laughs> that was what it was. <laughs> Hilarious. Yeah, the things, but it was the, the right sound. It was the right sound for the song. And it's hilarious that this this Casio um, VL tone still works. That is After, amazing. That was 1980 or something, and I remember getting it. And it actually does work as a calculator, too. <laughs> and you can <laughs> sample on the thing, you know. This was, like, so early on. Uh, and we still put it on lots of stuff, you know, uh, you know lots of... We do lots of indie records and they're like, oh, Casio, let me use that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect. You know, the, the thing that w is amazing to me is the serendipity of life and how one thing leads to another and, you know, you, you meet people who you don't think you're ever going to have anything to do with, but life is long and you sometimes the people that you meet are people that are key in your life later. I know mm. you've, you've found that's true. Sure. Um, coming back from France, I joined this Leisure Units band and, you know, it was, that was pretty amazing, even though I eventually got fired from that band. It was, it was a, a band that had too much talent and too much uh, controversy to really go very far, but they were great and they had amazing, amazing songs. The Leisure Units, I think they're not even on Spotify, but they're really cool songs if anybody wants to Google the Leisure Units. After I left the Leisure Units, I one of the guys in the Leisure Units said, hey, I'm going up to see this guy, Michael Zilka. Do you want to, um, do you have anything you want to, play for him I'm gonna see if I can get a record deal he's signing everything south of you know 14th Street and I was like oh okay uh, here's a here's something I did in my room which was on a little Porta studio and he went up and he came back and I said well did you get the record deal he said no you did <laughs> so I, I I got signed to Zilka which was fantastic you know and um, you know he he spent a bunch of money on me, and eventually the record didn't come out. But it was it was great. I think I worked. What do you remember the name of the the uh, studio that's outside of Philadelphia that was in the old Remington maybe uh, Gun Factory? Yeah, I think so. It was in an old, old it's in old an stone old building. It right. was in Gla Gladwin. Yes, it was in Gladwin. It was yeah, K Gem. K Gem, thank you, yeah. thank you. I was, yeah. I was trying to remember that. Um, yeah, it was the initials of the guys that were involved in establishing that studio. Is that and still exist? M, well, you know, it became the Boys to Men Studio after they left. Ah, uh, okay. And but I don't think it's a studio anymore. But I may be wrong. Well, at some point, you moved to Nashville, right? Right. Well, after I lost my record deal with Z. I met a girl at a party at uh, George DuBose, who was a photographer who took all the pictures from CBGBs and stuff. He'd taken pictures of me and Susanna for Ricky Vaughn. He was great, and he had a, a, a loft on East 3rd Street, which was a ground floor loft, sort of across from where the motorcycle 
uh, the Hell's Angels uh, hung out. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to a party all dejected because I'd just gone up to the Z office and I said, hi, how are you, Michael? Yeah, I, I always went to get my check, you know, and he goes like, Robin, I'm so sorry, but I, I can't give you a check this month. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going to drop you. I'm sorry. It was really, so I was bummed out. But then I ended up at this party and this girl came over and said, you see that girl over there? I think she likes you. And uh, that girl ended up becoming my wife. And I, that was 31 years ago. Mm. So pretty wild, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And she was from Na Nashville. She was still working as a model and going, you know, touring the world. But she was, um, she really well, didn't like being a model at all. She said, well, why don't you try Nashville? I went, came down. At first I went, oh, you know, this is bogus. But... Uh, I remember Kate Hyman's uh, boyfriend, who had been U2's lawyer, he suggested that I go. He heard my songs and stuff. Why doesn't Robin go? Why don't you go to Nashville? That's, that's where you might be able to find a home. So when I came down there, I had that in the back of my mind, and I was like, ah, I don't know about this town. But in the end, you know, it really uh, did turn out to be a really good place for me and I've flourished here um, my next the thing about Nashville that's really cool is that usually your next door neighbor is a guitar player and I had a little we had a little house when we and had a daughter and I thought my music days were over I was working as a landscaper but I would play and I had a 388 a Tascam 388 would play and record up there, up in the attic of my house. And my neighbor, uh, this guy, I heard a band rehearsing next door, and he came, knocked on the door, and he said, uh, can I be in your band? I'm not really crazy <laughs> about my band. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so we started a band, which was Left, Right, Left, and then became King Bub. We did well in the local scene, uh, got on the cover of the scene, I had a great time with uh, Brad, Brad Talbot, his name was. And one of the guys that would sub with us sometimes on bass was a guy named Brad Jones, who um, was a wonderful character and um, played music. He was just a great musician. He had had a band called the Dig Mandrakes, which was basically, uh, you know, that we started sort of the same time in Nashville. And you know, we, we kind of hit it off, and when I wanted to make a record for King Bub, we went over to my, my place in the mountains in North Carolina in, into this funky barn. I think we had, I can't even remember, what it was probably, it was an 8-track, I think. And we didn't have any, you know, we had one Mike Pre and the drums, it was just impossible to do the drums, so Brad programmed the drums. And I remember we just had the greatest time doing it. And when we got back uh, with the album, which, you know, it turned out okay, Brad said, well, that was so much fun. Why don't we look for a place to do a studio? And uh, my wife had, had gotten this big warehouse, and the guy who rented it to us said, hey, I, you know, I have a, a space next door as well. So now those two spaces our uh, Club Roar is the bigger warehouse studio, and then Alex the Great is a more traditional control room, cutting room studio next door. And we built these studios uh, from scratch. I mean, it was an amazing and fun experience to build a studio. I know you know that. But oh, I love you, building studios. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I, I would like to build another one. And if this construction next door <laughs> does, if it doesn't quiet down, I may have to. But um, it was wonderful, you know, looking at, you know, reading all the material of how to do, you know, a live live wall, dead wall, creating baffles and gobos, and um, figuring out uh, the window. We had a we had they were two separate at. At Alex the Great, there were two separate buildings. There was, 
it was it had been a construction company and there was one building that was there was like a perfectly like a six inch space between the big building and the small building the small building became the the control room and the big building is the cutting room and i remember we took we doubled up on the roof you know we had to get up there and you know made it a triple roof and you know constantly now we are always having to go check to make sure that it's not leaking and uh you know but we put these windows in and um you know we probably we didn't have that much money and i had a uh compressor and Brad had an 1100 Neve series thing and my compressor I had a Demeter uh, Mike Pre mm-hmm. and we had we didn't really have much gear at all and then ADATs came along and we we were some of the first guys in Nashville to have ADATs and we built this thing on nothing you know really it was and the rent that the guy was charging us was like you know four hundred dollars a month, wow. so it was really inexpensive, and um, I mean now there's uh, over six thousand square feet here. If you were looking to price that out in Nashville at the moment, it would be really ridiculous. But um, yeah, I I now that we own, my wife and I own the two buildings, and Brad Jones is constantly working at Alex the Great. He's doing a uh, a TV show right now, you know, doing the sound for a stop motion animation thing. I have two beautiful studios and um, we got a couple of uh, two inch MCIs, a choir machine for those that might know what that is, and you know, a 16 track. And um, so we have two uh, analog machines, which we use. Uh, now I'm using the, the one over here more for. Uh, I just was running inserts to it, you know, just doing, um, you know, effects, you know, out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then maybe going into this DBX 180 to kind of spread. Uh, <laughs> it's it's amazing using this old gear. Um, somebody came in the other day and said, well, I feel like when I come into your studio, I'm going back in time. And <laughs> it's... Uh, it's true that we do have a lot of old gear, although we do have some new gear too, including your beautiful F, you know, your your compressor. Having go- a good basis for, you know, just like basic gear, it's really all you need. You know, well, when I started the manufacturing business with our mic preamps as the first product, I figured there was probably a worldwide market for maybe a few hundred of those. And that would be it because... That's how many studios there were. Right. Well, you lucked out. (laughs) I know. And then, you know, it's just the right place at the right time because the technology was changing rapidly and the Internet came along. And those two things made it possible for a small company like mine to be an international company. And with the demise of most of the big studios... That, that was depressing, but for each one of those that, that left, it was replaced by, you know, what, 10,000 people recording at home. That's right. And a certain percentage of those people really understood the difference between what sounded really, really good and stuff that just sounded mediocre or worse. And so that's a large part of our business these days, which I would have never foreseen. But you're right, it's, it's, and it's, it's just really changed because studios used to be run by very technical people who had to be because the, the equipment required a lot of maintenance. And, you know, they might be very musical as well, but their main job was to keep everything working and translate the music as best they could to the tape format or whatever. But all that's gone, you know, for... $10,000, you can set up a real quality small studio. That's true. And that's I, that's just an amazing change. My studio is, is you know, our, I think it's one of the coolest studios in Nashville, but it's that's just because the space is cool and, you know, all the junk that I've thrown in here, it's, it's, it's not like 
it's not very technical. It's it's more of an artistic expression. So you know, kids like to come here for that. I mean, I have a guy who uh, I'm starting a record with a guy who's on Bayonet Records in New York, uh, Stuart Bruno, who's his band is called Lion Limb, and I I've done a bunch of work ever since he was in high school. I was working with him, and he's coming in uh, this weekend actually to start tracking doing overdubs i guess on songs that he's he's cut uh through one of your mic pre's uh in his little uh bedroom here in nashville and um it's kind of i guess he'll bring his i don't know whether he'll bring that mic pre but he's i know he's bringing um a harpsichord and uh, he read i sent him the harpsichord uh your harpsichord article and he was excited by that. And he said, well, would you want the harpsichord? I'm going back to New York, but I can't take the harpsichord. My, my apartment isn't big enough. Can I leave it at your your studio? So that's sort of the way studios evolve these days. <laughs> you know, if you have space, and I have space, so I have people's, you know, a drummer leaves his beautiful collection of vintage drums here in exchange. You know, I get to use them in exchange for that. And, you know, there's... Various pianos that people have left here, kind of kind of cool that way. But I just think it's amazing that here's this kid coming in. Uh, I've worked with him a lot uh, in the past, but now he's coming in. He's sort of becoming more of a producer himself of his own music, and he's coming in. You know, I, I'm going to record uh, overdubs and guitars and pianos and keyboards and. He's excited about that, and um, so am I. You know, I haven't seen, I haven't recorded him in a few years, so, and he's he's doing pretty well. Anyway, yeah, good um, for him. that's great. Yeah, that's great, and he he loves your your mic pre. Now he wants the uh, compressor, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I, you know, I well, we what can, I we can help him with that. Yeah. <laughs> what I want, <laughs> yeah, I know he can. What I want is the uh, I want an EQ. That's that's the one thing that I I feel like. I have some EQ, but I'd love to get one of your EQs eventually. Um, and you don't make you you make stereo EQs. You don't make solo EQs, do you? Yeah, it started out as a mono, the VT4, and we ended up selling them in pairs all the time. Oh, and, right. <laughs> and mastering guys were saying, "Can you make a stereo version? You know, so I don't have to switch." two controls and and I uh and I don't have the space, you know, in my rack for all these EQs. So we made the VT five, which is just a stereo version, but now that's the big seller. And it's right, right. Know, sort of found a home in a lot of mixing and mastering guys. But we still make the VT four and in fact uh, you know, my mic here uh, right now is going through one of them. Oh uh, okay. I also have been hearing good things about the Hazel Rig uh, um, stuff, which I know. Yeah, the v- VLC. Yeah, yeah, just cool uh, Mike Pre, and um, that's great that you hooked up with those guys. You said they were also really great musicians. They are great musicians. I should send send you some of the stuff they've done. It was George Hazel Rig that was doing the harpsichord recording. We did a couple, well, last month, I guess it was. Yeah, I mean, whenever possible, they're on any projects I'm doing because they're such good players. Uh, George plays key, keyboards and, and Joff plays bass. Up, upright bass is his main instrument, but it'll play electric if you can talk him into it. And they've just been terrific to work with. And Joff worked for me for many years as an assembler and wanted to start his own manufacturing business. So I designed that VLC for them. And that turned out in retrospect to sort of be their audition for taking over the manufacturing of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so now they do that, which which is great because they're they're doing a great job with that, and I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know um, my one of my main. Uh, I've written a bunch of stuff with uh, Jill Sobule, who had a, a hit on "I Kissed a Girl" uh, back in the day, and it was on an MTV hit when they were still doing videos. And you know, she sends she sends me uh, her 
iPad stuff, which sounds so good, you know. I, I, I just can't believe it, you know, how, how cool it is. Yeah, uh, it's pretty amazing. People have made whole records that way. It's, it's, oh, yeah. It's remarkable. Well, you know, that leads into the next thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, your success as a songwriter and co-writer and so on was some fairly substantial records. Yeah, I mean, you know, the I made most of my money on on the Jill Sobule um, co-writes, but I also, um, I mean, I've done some records. I ha- have uh, a guy who's who's been helping me, and he said, "Well, find find a band, find a, a young band," and so the the Spinto band, which the the children of my brother and Scott Burney, who was in the Sin City band kind of staples in the Delaware uh, scene. Um, yep, I remember them. A- anyway, um, Spinto Band was an amazing project. I really loved it. Uh, and Nick Krill is working out of Philadelphia or Wilmington and doing um, really cool stuff. And I think he might have won a Grammy for something. But anyway, it's, it's wonderful how the people, you know, the segue from talking about these Hazel Rig guys and then you know, we are mentors now, and uh, it's great when people that you've worked with on projects, they go on and they uh, you see them rise to power, and it's so uh, gratifying. You know, I never realized, uh, my father was a chemist, and he always said it was really gratifying to him when some of his people that uh, he worked with at the experimental station in Delaware went on to become world-known uh, chemists, and it's some of these, some of the, uh, our biggest competition here in Nashville are our old, are our interns. It's, uh, they go off and with, you know, $5,000 or whatever, $10,000, they, they build a studio and start recording, and it's just so great. We won't be around forever, so I think it's really important that we pass along, you know, what we've learned over all these years to younger people. And it's not so much the knowledge because that's always changing and the technology, the music's always changing, but more the attitude and the and the, and the, just the love of making great music. And I think that's a big responsibility we have to make sure that, you know, we can help inspire other people to carry on with that. That is so, so true. I mean, I, I think being able to bring a relaxed quality to the room when people come in, they're all nervous. They're like, oh, I'm on the clock. I'm on the clock. And you have to just put them totally at ease and make sure that they understand that they're, it's just music. We're making music. It's fun. It has to be fun. Right. <laughs> you <know>? That's right. <laughs> and. That's something that I, I remember you being very good at. I mean, you have a very laid back demeanor and and you know, I'm pretty good at it myself and um I mean it's just one I mean, we're lucky guys. We get to do this, you know. I know um, we are. That's yeah, true. Ro- Roger Roger Mutino, who's a good friend of mine and I kinda am semi responsible for bringing him down to Nashville. Anyway, he was working with Lou Reed and you know, Lou Reed <laughs> he said Lou Reed turned to me and said Man, Raj, I, I can't believe I, they still let me do this. I'm still doing this. And this was like in 1980 or whatever. And, yeah. Uh, it's good to have gratitude for that. We're lucky guys. But, yeah. You know, we, well, one thing, you know, I just recently did a project with some people that are really talented musicians, but had next to, to no studio experience. And they were very nervous about it. And we had a actually a Zoom meeting, because that's the way you do things these days, before the session. You know, I explained to them what the process would be and how we had two days to do this and it was going to be very laid back and everything. But the key thing I said to them, and, and they remembered this, and I, I'm sure they'll, they're will they unlikely to forget it. I said, if you're not having fun, we're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, because it shouldn't, music should not be a chore and recording shouldn't be a chore. Uh, you know, it should be 
fun to make music. Yeah, I mean, if it isn't, you're you're in the wrong business because you're sure you're not guaranteed you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's uh, it's just you never know when the anomaly will pop out. That's what what I always think about, and I I love that you know, like I can remember being in Paris making that record and this bass player who had played with a famous jazz person you know I said well can we do this again because I hit a uh, I hit a bad note and he said the music is the mistake (laughs) and I was like (laughs) there's lots of lots of mistakes that have ended up being the signature signature thing on a the tambourine up too loud or, you know, whatever, you know, things that stick out. Yep. Yeah, you're right. I think records that strive for perfection end up losing a lot of their potential interest. Well, they do. You're right. Because now with this gear, you know, you can go over and over and over and over and over again until you get it perfect, perfectly in time and in tune but somehow it was better when it was just the demo that was done as an instant message or as a, a voice memo on the uh, on the f- phone, you know. That was really good. <laughs> I know. Voice... That, that's always been the case, you know, trying to capture whatever it was about that demo that got you right. excited about the song to begin with uh, is always a challenge in the studio. Yeah, case in point was that the veritable demos which i didn't have the multi-tracks in france and if 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 it was today i wouldn't have had to have uh, gone to a studio and spent you know a hundred thousand dollars to redo those because we would have just used them you know and Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. fixed a little or added something or i don't know you know but it's it's really true and it's still the case that i i find when people play me stuff that sounds good to me. I go, well, why Why do you need to go beyond this? You know, what do you want to put on? And, well, we really just want to do it in a real studio. And I'm like, but it, this sounds so good. You know, why don't you just put this out? A lot of people are putting it out. You can put it out today. I don't know why. I mean, I I have the, my COVID record. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to put it out, but I, I enjoy making it. And I'm uh, looking forward to putting it out and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. And someone said, well, why don't you just put it out <laughs> on, <laughs> on, on <laughs> distro kids? There's my doggy. <laughs> there must be someone here. But, um, you know, it's, it's an, a, an amazing time that we're living through technologically. I was, I don't know if you've been checking out the Dolby Atmos stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, yep. I'm, I'm wondering I'm wondering about that. And I, I was on vacation. I met this guy who designed the Apple stores. I think his last name was Ohm. And he wrote, called me one time and said, hey, I'm doing these, this thing called Dolby Atmos. That was like, I guess, about eight years ago or something or 10 years ago Mm -hmm. and I said well what's that and he says well there's speakers all over the place and you know and now there's actually you know plugins that you can get from Dolby Mm -hmm. Atmos for free you can download that and I I don't know I've always been a kind of two speaker guy I never was into quad or 5.1 but this intrigues me it really does. I, I mean, I did the, the music for my daughter's uh, film, which is Mountain Rest, which mm-hmm. is avail- available on Amazon. Anyway. Yep. Oh, we've, we've watched it, yeah. <clears throat> oh, you did? Oh, mm-hmm. I'm so, so happy. Um, yeah. that's, the, that's the cabin in the mountains in North Carolina that I go up to. Anyway. Yeah, I, I think you told me that, so I was looking at it in that light watching the film. Yeah, well, I hope you enjoyed it, and um, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the the um, you know the whole idea of doing film stuff that's that's another you know you can't just do sound recordings these days. You have to do video and set up for streaming during the recording. All that kind of stuff uh, adds to the interest of your studio, and um, so we're starting to do some of that. 
there there's a series of uh, Alex the Great videos of some artists, uh, black and white stuff that Brad set up two cameras and just did it next door. And I mean, I just think more than ever before, there's so much, you know, the need for content is still there. And you just have to be bold and do stuff that's that's out there and and or that's in there or however you want to put it some if you make something that is entertaining to listen to you have a good shot at uh, making making it into the uh, culture yep it's an important part of uh, the music business these days and it's it's a little frustrating to me because unless the project has the budget to hire somebody to do that uh, it's really not practical you know, to be running a session and also keeping track of cameras and all that. So we don't do as much of that as we'd like to. Yeah, well, I haven't done that much, but this room is so big that um, there's room for cameramen and all equipment in here. And we, um, we've been doing a little bit of it. What is the most important thing that you've, you've learned in all of your years of doing this? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Well, I always say I learn something new at every session, and I, and that is absolutely true. And so I'm constantly adding to what I know. You know, I don't have a commercial studio now. I don't have to rely on it for income. So I can be very selective about who I work with. And... I, I think I've become much more confident in my ability to help guide their music. Because I work with a lot of really good producers, and some of them are very open to, 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 to observations I had about the project. Others were absolutely not. And I think working with people that just sort of shut you down when you suggested something, um, it took me a while to get past that and say, I know what I want this to sound like and, you know, do whatever needs to be done to make it sound that way. So I think that's probably the biggest thing overall that I've learned is to just trust your own instincts, your own taste, and, you know, make the music what you think it should be. Right. And and I think as you go along project to project, you you learn how you learn from your mistakes and you learn how to listen to the people around you rather than just bulldozing through you know um mm -hmm. i think it's really important that you know a lot of stuff has to get done quickly when you're paying for studio time but it's still it's really important to listen to what the artist is wants to say that's the you know the song is king and i think for me the most important some of the most important things that i've learned is that uh i love i, I used to like work non-stop and you know my wife would call and say i have a delicious dinner and i say oh i can't come home you know now i go home you know i don't i think you you know it's it's important to uh, your your life, your whole uh, your life is the important thing, and having a good time. Everything has to be in balance. In balance, right? And that's something that it's it takes a while to get that equilibrium. You know, I know I, I work with people that are feel like they're you know getting taken advantage of or whatever, and I'm like, well, you know, you'll have your day. <laughs> you're right now. You're young, and you're 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 making. You're, you're helping people do what they do, but you can't, you, you know, you, you've got to realize that the, this is something that it's not your project. It's not, you're not the, the important person. The important person is the artist or the song. So anyway, yeah, I'm sort of with you on all that. That's uh, just, it's important. Robin, let me ask you this. You know, you've done so many things. You've, you've played in a band, you've written songs, you've been a studio owner, a producer, of, of all those things, what's your favorite aspect of that? What's your favorite thing? Well, my favorite thing is, is creative content. I like being involved in helping people 
if I'm writing with somebody, helping people come up with a better song, a better recording. Um, you know, it, it really, I, I feel like I'm still the kid with the ukulele that I got from the closet. You know, I think it's really having the, the perspicuity to just be relaxed and in the moment and not not somewhere else or not thinking you should be somewhere else doing something better or the moment is the most important thing and that's a cliche but it's true yep i agree with you well we sort of hinted at this before uh and you gave some really good thoughts on this but you know for people that are coming up now and you've dealt with a lot of people that that turned out to be pretty successful what they did You know, if somebody wanted to follow your path as a songwriter, what what kind of advice would you give them? Well, I would say, you know, the continuity of keeping a journal with bits and pieces of snippets of something that you, you think of. You know, I have like hundreds of little notebooks and journals where I, if I come up with a line or I'm driving and I... I come up with something, I'll, I'll put it down. And now, of course, there's uh, great, the cell phone is so great for this. Uh, you know, you can go to Evernote or, uh, you know, voice memos and just, you put these snippets down. And then all of a sudden, maybe five years later, that snippet finds a home in a song. Most people feel like, well, I'm not a songwriter. I can't, I can't do this. I don't, I'm not a writer, I'm, but nowadays, you know, you can have, you know, the groove is in the heart or whatever, and it just it's just one line that somehow with the right singer and uh, the right accompaniment, it becomes a hit. You just have to establish a continuity from one day to the next of something that you do. You create a habit of, of writing things down or, or singing into your phone or... And then when you get together with people and you're with musicians, those things are, you know, at your beck and call because you've you've done them and you tend to remember them more if you you've written them down or or sung them down. So that's sort of my modus operandi. And also, I like doing it just on the fly. You know, if there's a band playing and I'm at the microphone, some of my better uh, songs have come out of just like improv and just like going for it. You don't say you 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 don't say no before you just say yes all the time to the stuff that's coming from the collective unconscious. Because I really do believe that a lot of stuff comes through artists from the collective unconscious, and you know it comes to everybody actually who taps into that. I know that's kind of a woo woo kind of thing to say, but. I really do believe that. And, um, you know, I, I know that because sometimes the, I'll have a really great idea and, and a, a day later I hear that idea on, on a song or it comes out, you know. So, and that's what's good about having a record deal where you can, you can get it out before the other people, <laughs> you know. Or, uh, but now you can just you can put it online, you know, immediately uh, if you're smart. Right. Well, I agree with you, Robin, about the it, there's times where, you know, you do something creatively, you know, whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be in music, but in any field. And you just stop and say, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of a magic. Yeah. Well, it is magic. We could call it magic or the collective unconscious or yeah. whatever, you know, it just pops out, you know. I think there's a lot of people are discovering that the the amount of product out there right now is just staggering. Spotify and, you know, Apple Music and all those places you go and it's just you can you you can listen for a long time and then every once in a while you hear something that's absolutely brilliant, which is great. Yeah, I guess the challenge these days is to get that brilliant piece to break through. That's right. Uh, you can get stuff to radio stations all over the country, and if they listen to one song and like it, they might air it on their little indie station. Or, you know, radio is 
not what it was, but there's still ways of getting it out there that aren't just Instagram and and Facebook, you know, and or putting out a whole album, you know, putting out things one at a time, and then maybe once you get a response and start building a following, then put out the whole shebang, you know. That's what I've been advised, you know. I, I'm in the position of a every 13-year-old, 14-year-old kid putting out a record, you know. It's, it's the same for this record I'm going to put out. You know, you have to you have to go through the same, jump through the same hoops as everybody else these days and hope that someone likes it, you know, and passes it off to their friend who goes, wow, that's cool. And then if you get like five million streams, then the, the record biz people will get interested in you. Believe me, they'll come, come a knocking. Is networking still an important part of this? Well, I think networking is. Um, networking with other musicians, other um, with your friends, and I guess that's something I'm really bad at because my, you know, my Instagram has like two pictures on it, and my other Instagram has like pictures of the studio and people working in the studio. But it's, I think, the more you do that, I mean, people that are really good at it, like my friend Jill Sobiel, who I write with a lot, she's posting two or three times a day to her her people. And that, you know, whether you have a Patri- Patreon account or however you're going to fund your, your uh, next thing, if you're looking to get funding, you know, it, it really has helped her, I think. She would say that it, it's really... It's part of her life now, you know. She's just always on and doing clever things. So, I don't know. I mean, I think networking is really super important. I'm not good at it, but I'm going to try and get better. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did your network grow? Was it just it was the gear that went out and spoke for itself, right? Well, in the manufacturing business, absolutely. You know, it was going to the trade shows, AES and NAM. You know, the first time I was there, I I knew a few people, but basically I didn't know anybody in the business. And for the small niche manufacturing like I do, there's not that many of us. And even though we might be competing for the same customers, we have much more in common. And it's really important, I think, for for us to sort of stick together and support each other because... It's tenuous for a lot of people, and a lot of people don't make it. So some of my best friends are my fellow manufacturers, you know. We may be competing for the same sale, but we're still really good friends. That's great. Yeah. And and then the customers, you know. The customers would come to the show, and they'd want to they wanna talk. They want to shake your hand back in the old days when you could do that safely or maybe it wasn't that safe, and, uh, you know, take a picture. (laughs) You know, some of those people are just starting out, and maybe they'll be successful, maybe they won't. But a lot of those people turned out to be really successful. And it was like, you know, we've maintained that relationship through their success, and I couldn't be happier for them. Once you sort of get a little bit your foot in the door at that level, suddenly you meet a lot more people. And then pretty soon you're talking to the top people in the field. And yeah, I mean, aside from just, you know, making these wonderful friendships, it's also very valuable for whatever it is you're doing, whether you're a musician, a manufacturer, a songwriter or whatever, just making that ever widening circle of friends is really good. I'm much better at doing that in person than I am with social media. Me too. You know, it's just I didn't grow up with it like kids today. So it's hard for me to think in those terms. I mean, we try to do better. And we now have a person that handles our social media who's a young person who's very, very good at it. And that's made a big difference. But for me, it's always meeting these people in person, whether it's at a trade show or, you know, going to their studio and just 
getting to know them. And those have been the most successful things for me in, in the manufacturing business, for sure. And I think that generally applies to any field. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, I like the fact that, I like, yesterday my uh, studio partner next door brought the session that was over there over, and there was there was a girl there, and, you know, and you say hi, and then you know, oh, are you a songwriter? Yeah, I'm a songwriter. You know, oh, you want to write? You know, I mean, you never really know what's going to happen, but I think if you always put yourself forward as someone who's willing to interact with other people in your field, you know, you're, you're going to do okay. We all learn as we go. And it's so nice to meet all these people that, I mean, Nashville is like just, there's so many new people moving into town. It, it, I met this keyboard pl player, Rob Berger, who just walked into the studio the other day too. He worked with Lots of great people, Lou Reed, I, I was told, and a bunch of other people. But he's like, you know, he just moved to Nashville a year ago, just when COVID was about to start. And he's looking to, you know, oh, cool, let me come and play on some stuff, you know. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's really, being in Nashville is a really great place. I mean, I, if you're thinking of moving here, please don't, because we have enough. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, come on down. I mean, it's it's a great place, and there's there's room for a lot a lot of people here. Um, yeah. Well, I've been to Nashville many many times, and you know, I never seriously considered moving there. But it is a unique place in so many ways. Well, next time you come, you got to come over and and have dinner. We'll do absolutely. That. Absolutely. I want to see yeah. your studios, too. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll uh, you'll enjoy that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe I'll have one of your EQs by that time. Maybe I'll uh, bring it to dinner. Yeah, bring it to dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I've been talking with my longtime friend, singer-songwriter and studio owner, Robin Eaton. You can listen to a couple of Robin's songs on my website, dougfern.com. Find them under Extras. Thank you for your continued support of this podcast. My aim is to pass along my experience in the world of audio, music, and recording. If you find this interview useful, please share it on your social media and tell your friends who might be interested. Thanks. This is my take on music recording. I'm Doug Fern. See you next time.